The seminar on how should central banks battle high inflation will be starting shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, How Should Central Banks Battle High Inflation Seminar will be starting in five minutes. Please take your seats and switch your phones to silent mode.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage your moderator, Tom Keen, and the distinguished panelists for this seminar on how should central banks battle high inflation. Let us get right to it. Uh, we're a little late, we apologize for that. Some of our panelists had some serious commitments and so now we will start a little late. We have to stop at 12.30. I thank the IMF, given what I believe is the importance of this panel in this original set of meetings to extending this. I really, really appreciate that. I've got a countdown clock. It says we've got three hours to go. I'm gonna truncate the introductions. So many in this room are informed of their abilities. I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, the governor of the Bank of Korea is with us. 99% of the room knows his esteemed commitment to this institution. Uh, Cheng Young Ri uh, is someone with a decidedly different view on inflation. I'm not gonna ask him when he's gonna raise rates again, but uh, it, is, it is wonderful to have him here to give us not an emerging market perspective, but the perspective of the Korean people and their successes in their economy, particularly given all that we've seen, not the tensions, but COVID and the rest in uh, Asia. Uh, Samana Tenreo is with us. Uh, she's with the Bank of England, of course, as an external member, but far more uh, with the London School of Economics and her heritage there. And as a professor in economics, and, and I inflict upon her, we will talk about the Phillips curve just for her. Uh, next, we have Dr. Alarian. I, I don't know much about him. Uh, he's with a small school in England. Uh, he, in, he was, full disclosure, on the show today. He was borderline, we'll have to see, but we are thrilled that Dr. Alarian, with his service to the IMF, could join us. And uh, I really want to state that, that he and Bill Gross reinvented dialogue and conversation across economics, finance, and investment years ago. Um, Dr. Gopinath, uh, you have a nodding acquaintance with. Uh, she has been exceptionally important in dovetailing the IMF, and for my case, to an American audience with a, with a wonderful global perspective. And I, Gita, thank you for your leadership in putting this most wonderful moment together. Um, Olivier's here, and I'm hugely biased. I'll mention that in a moment, but of course, we all know his service to economics. Uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, all that he's done, uh, and now at the Peterson Institute. And he told me I gotta sell a few copies. This is my book of the summer. It's my skinniest book. It reads like a screenplay. He's gonna sell the movie rights. This is lovely whether you agree or disagree with it. It is Blanchard on our star minus G, and so much as else, and I really can't say. I've never done that, Olivier, but it is the book of the summer, and the summer is upon us. Let us begin right now. Three ideas before all the news flow of the recent weeks, the inflation challenge strategies for reducing uh, inflation, lessons for future policy strategy. First, we have to get through this uh, strategy. <coughs> Dr. Gopinath, let me begin uh, with you on what you've learned at these meetings about inflation what you've learned here about the challenge forward given the many different vectors country to country of inflation. Thank you, Tom, and it's a real pleasure to join this very illustrious panel. Inflation remains a serious problem in many countries. So yes, we've seen headline inflation peak last year, and it's coming down thanks to falling energy prices in many countries. But that said, if you look at core inflation, that remains stubbornly high and is quite sticky. So we are in an environment where monetary policy has tightened quite considerably in many countries, but we are yet to see that show up in softening of labor market conditions in several major economies, including the US. Uh, and in the euro area. Now, there is no historical precedent where inflation has come down without a softening in labor market conditions. So I think we are still going to see the effect of monetary policy play out, 
and this is why it shows up in our numbers, the slowing growth. At the same time, last, in March, we had financial market turmoil in some banks in the US and one big bank in Switzerland. And that has also raised questions about financial market stress. So again, I think what I'm hearing here is that central bankers feel very sure that they need to stay the course on bringing inflation down and have the confidence that the financial policy tools that they have can keep the financial system stable, given what we're seeing right now. Dr. Gopada, thank you so much. Uh, keep the mics on here, please. I don't want to miss a word uh, with everyone, uh, please. Dr. Tenreo, let me, let me go to you. And I really want to parse between public officials here working for central banks now and those that are free and clear. And you have a responsibility to the Bank of England, of, of course. And uh, what I would find interesting about the inflation challenge is not a window into BOE policy, but, but far more the inflation challenge and the tools forward, what you have learned at BOE about the path forward given what we've lived with really harmful inflation on the continent and within the United Kingdom. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, during the tightening cycle, there are no um, constraints on, on, on tools as when we are in a loosening cycle. So we've been using bank rate as a main policy tool to uh, um, tighten monetary policy. Now, the one thing I would say, and that's what we learned from, um, uh, from history, is that there are long lags in the transmission of monetary policy. And it's still too early in the game. And most of the tightening in monetary policy happened in the second half of last year. Uh, so we are still to see most of that tightening passing through the economy. And so at one stage, um, I mean, uh, we need to be patient. Uh, that's, that's what we learned from um, Milton Fritz, Friedman's uh, metaphor on, on the pool in the shower. Uh, we don't want to get burned. We don't want to a nice cold shower. So we need to be patient. But I want to discuss, because uh, um, this, this was uh, uh, something to, to brought, you brought up, um, the tools and any tensions in the tools as we face financial stability uh, concerns as well, which, which is what uh, uh, was in, in part the theme of, of the meetings. Um, and I'd like to make a, a basic point here. There's no inherent difficulty with moving one policy tool in one direction, bank rate, and uh, uh, balance sheet policies in another direction, and indeed, that change in policy mix is often the optimal thing to do in response to many shocks when there are multiple tools and many um, and multiple targets. That's a logic in, in the Timbergen uh, rule, that we need any independent targets in order, uh, tools in order to hit any in independent targets. Now, as to which tool should be used for different purposes, the op optimal thing to do is to use, to assign the tools based on their relative effectiveness at uh, achieving each goal. Uh, and again, when we are away from the lower bound for monetary policy, bank rate is the most effective tool to uh, meet the inflation target in the medium term. And consistent with that division of responsibilities in the UK, the framework sets out that uh, uh, interest rates should be the last tool or the last defense against financial stability risks. Uh, there are a range of macroprudential tools that can be used to address financial stability uh, risks. And uh, in that setting, uh, bank rate can focus on, on the main monetary policy remit. Uh, if those macroprudential tools affect demand or inflation, we can always adjust bank rate in order to restore the appropriate uh, monetary policy stance. So, so there's no tension there when you have the tools. Um, so I'll stop there. Okay, very good. For the audio people, if we could get a speaker pointed up to us, all of us are struggling with the different echoes in that. I don't know if there's a monitor speaker we can uh, turn around here. I think that would help us a lot up on uh, stage if you can uh, uh, do that. Let me continue with public officials here. Uh, Dr. Ree, you have a, just, it, it's a glorious resume of dealing with the challenges of the moment, 
of running Asia Pacific for IMF for years and then going back to your Korea and providing real leadership here on the inflation challenge. Describe the distinction of the inflation challenge on the Pacific Rim and on EM versus so much of what's talked about uh, in Washington and other major cities. Thank you, Tom. I think it will be very hard to generalize EM uh, uh, response uh, uh, in this case because uh, the strong dollar come with a high energy price this time. So depending on whether they are commodity exporters or importers, external pressure uh, has been quite heterogeneous. Having said that, I think most of EMs this time rely on uh, flexible exchange adjustment as a shock observer more than before because the uh, strong dollar was a common phenomenon and there was a less stigma attached for their own depreciation. And also, uh, this case shows that effectiveness of IPF work that Gita led a long time. Uh, in our case, especially uh, foreign exchange intervention was widely and usefully used. In our case, for last September and October, we had to rely on the FX intervention because the, our exchange rate uh, depreciated much more faster than expected when U.S. increased the uh, interest rate 75 BPs for consecutive time. And our aim is to uh, basically prevent the uh, destabilizing group caused by the margin calls of FX derivatives and hedging instrument. Uh, in our market, most of the maturity of uh, this hatching instrument affects derivatives is three to six months. So when exchange rate depreciates really faster than certain threshold and beyond expectation, investors are forced to uh, cover their uh, margin costs and capital loss within a couple of months. So by, uh, through the FX intervention, by slowing down their uh, exchange uh, depreciation, we can give a room to the investors to adjust to the new reality. So this is a good example of uh, effectiveness of uh, internet integrated policy framework, especially FIX, FX intervention as a uh, stabilizer for short term rather than a replacement of the sound macroeconomic policy. Very good. Uh, Dr. Olarian, and, and we keep score on this, of course, in my world of who's right, who's wrong. We learn more from people who, wrong, who are wrong. Last time Mohammed was wrong had to do with the New York Jets a few years ago. So let's cut to where you were right. You were way out front on this concept of transitory. You were way out front on the calculus of getting to higher rates. So within the inflation challenge, I want an Alarian look back here. Did they raise rates too quickly, particularly within the US Central Bank? Thank you, Tom. And let me just say, it's such a pleasure to be back at the IMF. It feels like coming home. And Gita, thank you for inviting me. Um, they raise rates too fast because it took them so long to raise rates. So when you are late, and in this case very late, you have no choice but to try and catch up. And what we are discovering is that while the economy is relatively resilient to higher rates, and in fact has surprise on the upside, the financial system is a different story. The financial system has been conditioned by many, many years of ultra-loose monetary policies. You have business models that will not make sense if rates have to be high for long. And we are yet to see the deleveraging that is still on the cards. So people talk about commercial real estate. A lot of project when they need to be refinanced no longer makes sense. And that's going to be questioned, where does that loss end up? We've seen the hold to maturity securities that can cause a problem if you lose your, the confidence of your depositors. So I think the next challenge, as much as we talk about is there a recession, is there not a recession, which is, of course is very important, but the real challenge for policymaker is going to come from how does the financial system that was conditioned to live with ultra low interest rates and abundant liquidity, how does it adjust to a world of what I think, because I agree with Gita, inflation will be sticky, what will be um, a world of higher rates for longer? I, I want to stop here, and there's such an informed audience here, and indeed worldwide, that I want to stop, but there's a point 
along a financial crisis, say 07, 08, 09, where there's events that happen, and they engage the debate. And Professor Blanchard did that a number of months ago, as he's done in different essays uh, throughout all this, the pandemic and such, by joining something that all of you are very familiar with, which is R star minus G. I think the first time I heard it was Stiglitz was beating me up. And you, you've really advanced this, Olivier, and I don't think you're aware of the cottage industry you've invented of people who agree with you, maybe go further and look for a more suppressed r star And uh, some other people are pretty upset with you. So frame out right now this inflation challenge, not so much to link it over to your fiscal work in your new monograph, but, but frame out the inflation challenge that you see with the experience of coming out of the pandemic. Some people say we're free and clear, maybe look at China, et cetera. But frame out where R star minus G is right now. Continue forward from what you did in your book on the challenge of inflation. So I had prepared answers to a different question. Okay. <laughs> we all did. That is tough. But why am I shocked? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to recover. Um, on our star, I would say that what we have to do in thinking about future our star is to think about the after inflation. Is there any reason to think that we go back to where we were mm -hmm. or inflation, this episode has hysteric effects? Now, having said this, I want to go back to a question Please. to ask the other guys Please. Uh, on, on inflation and monetary policy, which I Please. think is, is related. Thank you. Uh, so on inflation, I had two remarks. The first one is, so on this, I've actually worked a lot on US inflation over the last few months. And so I have a sense of the data. And I see good news and bad news. So on the good news, you may remember then when the Biden 1.9 trillion program was announced, I actually said this is going to lead to runaway inflation. It turned out that there was inflation, but the reasons for it were not at all the reasons that I had anticipated. I thought that this enormous increase in demand would lead to very low unemployment, enormous wage pressure, the anchoring of expectations, and the thing would just blow up. And the news is, and that's the good news, it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the Phillips curve type relation, the relation between unemployment and uh, wage pressure has remained more or less the same. Expectations have remained anchored. Doesn't mean they don't move, they move with inflation, but in the same way as before. The coefficient, if you want, on past inflation informing expectation has not increased. Mm -hmm. So that's very good news, and I see this as the result of 20 years of investment in credibility uh, by, by, by the central bank. So that's the good news. The bad news is that as we were looking, or as I was looking at the labor market, the action came from the goods market, uh, and that's where the inflation came from. Uh, and I think we, had, we were in a world based on past experience where we thought, okay, wages will go up, there'll be a markup, prices will increase. And much more than that happened. We got a very large increase in commodity prices with energy or food. We got all kinds of shortages leading to price spikes. Uh, and that led to very large increases in the price uh, given the wage. And if you try to decompose the history of inflation over the last two years, that has been the dominant factor. Uh, the big question, which I think is not fully answered, I have a view, is, well, why did these commodity prices go up so much? Is it a coincidence, or is it, in fact, the same source, with the enemy, very high demand, leading to high demand for these goods and an increase in commodity prices? So one way of summarizing it is I thought demand would work through the labor market. It worked through the goods market. Uh, the good news is that if these commodity price stabilize, and they have, uh, then we are left only with the labor market part. There, the labor market is, in my view, in the U.S., is overheated, so the Fed has to slow down. Inflation is going to come down quite a bit on its own, but it will not come down uh, to, to 3%, so uh, to 2%. Uh, 
I have three points so you have an optimism, that I can wait. You have an optimism we're going to get back to a 2% level. So that's an interesting question. So this, you, know, you also asked us to think about changes in monetary policy in the future. So as you know, I have been a proponent of a higher target inflation rate. I started at 4% 10 years ago. And then I've concluded that it made inflation too salient and it would change behavior mm -hmm. too much. And I have cut the pie in two and I'm at 3%. Now, two things. I'm perfectly happy with central banks saying we don't want to discuss it now because they really want to indicate that they're committed. So I'm perfectly happy to have uh, a scene to myself and the central banks not come. Mm -hmm. But the other point is people say, oh no, 1% and who cares? And just to give you a sense of things, if we had 1% average inflation and therefore 1% average higher nominal rates, this would give 1% more room for monetary policy to adjust, right? which is the... Now, 1% doesn't seem to be a whole lot, but that's exactly what we got through QE. Mm -hmm. So there's a way of saying if we'd had 1% more, we could have achieved the same result without QE. And I think most of us would feel this would be worth it. So on this, I still think that that's something we well, seriously has to think about. What I want to do here, because this is such a wonderful panel, is I want them to jump in here. I don't want to do some structured thing. You're all going to nod off of, asleep. The gentle lady from the Bank of England signaled over to me, hello, I want to respond. Respond, yeah. <laughs> please, Dr. Tadreo. Yeah, just, uh, you know, coming back. First to the point that Mohamed made about central banks being too late. I think we need to move the discussion from the qualitative to the quantitative. I mean, how late and how much you would have gained because we all by now have, have done these exercises and the picture doesn't change much. I mean, to really have a dent on inflation in Europe or in the UK, you would have needed to raise interest rates to double digits in the middle of the pandemic when we were trying to um, you know, keep the economy from collapsing. And um, so I think it's very important to do the numbers and have a quantitative rather than a qualitative discussion on this. Um, and I want to reinforce something that uh, Olivier said on um, uh, inflation has increased everywhere, but uh, the triggers of that inflation have not been the same. So arguably, I mean, the quantities uh, differ, quantitative exercises, but in the US, arguably, stronger demand has been um, a, a bigger trigger of inflationary pressures. Uh, whereas the picture is very different in the UK or in Europe. And we can see that reflected in private demand. For example, in the, UK, in, in the US, uh, consumption has been running above pre-COVID trend pretty much since the middle of 2021. In the UK, consumption has been well below pre-COVID trends and even below pre-COVID levels. So we're not even back to 2019 levels in terms of consumption. And Europe is um, somewhere in between, between, but closer to the UK, actually. So it recovered to the 2019 levels of consumption, but it's obviously well below pre-COVID trends. So this picture is very different. Um, and even in the US, the supply and demand imbalances uh, had an element of supply curtailment um, given the lockdowns around the world. But in the UK and in the Euro area, those manifested themselves as, a, as mm -hmm. an enormous cost push shock in the form of higher imported goods prices and followed immediately by an, another extraordinary shock, ma much bigger than the one we saw in the 70s uh, with the increase in, in prices of energy and, and commodities. So we need to distinguish those for the response right. of monetary policy and public policy in general. Well, as I think I, I saw years of the World Economic Outlook, what's, what's needed is humility. Dr. Larian, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I just want to respond. I think in the, U, in the case of the US, it is very different from, from the UK and from the ECB. I think the US, had it started earlier, we would not have had to have such a concentrated increase in interest rates and we would not be in the midst of this trilemma of trying to simultaneously lower inflation, minimize damage to growth, and maintain financial stability. Once you get to Europe, the story gets much more complicated. And you touched upon why it gets complicated. But I think in, in, the, U, in the US, it's clear. 
And I just, I just want to align myself with Olivier. I think in a perfect world, we wouldn't have a 2% inflation target for a world of deficient aggregate supply. And for the next few years, we are in a world of deficient aggregate supply. We have change in globalization that is fragmenting supply chains. We have companies themselves who have recognized that they didn't focus enough on resilience. So they themselves are building different supply chains. You hear the, the just in time also has to come with just in case. We have an energy transition. All these three things are inherently inflationary. And if we try to run economy, so an arbitrary target of 2%, remember that's completely arbitrary, we will sacrifice a lot. Now I agree with Olivier, the key issue is how do you, how do you change your inflation target when you've been way above your inflation target for a while. And that's why central bankers don't want to talk about it, but the issue is not going to disappear. Mm -hmm. This is an issue that has to be confronted if you believe, like I do, that the characterization of the global economy has gone from deficient aggregate demand after the global financial crisis to now deficient aggregate supply. Dr. Gobineth, you've addressed many of these themes, not only in this world economic outlook, but across four years of uh, uh, pandemic. And what I'm hearing here, not so much it's every country for itself, or not so much that it's idiosyncratic, but there's so many different narratives of inflation right now. So many different colors of inflation worldwide. Can we have a general policy out of a general institution like the IMF, or is it truly every central bank for itself? So firstly, since the title of this panel is how to bring how should central bankers bring inflation down? I think we should all say very clearly that at this point, moving the inflation target is probably not the, the thing any of us would advocate. <laughs> we want to make sure that we get inflation going in the right direction. On your uh, you know, broader question about what does inflation look like globally, there has been some very, what looks like a very common component to inflation, which came from goods prices going up everywhere. When energy prices went up and now that they're coming down, you're seeing pretty much everywhere this pattern where headline inflation has started coming down. But at the same time, in many countries, you're, still, you're seeing core inflation being very sticky, even in countries where they raised interest rates way ahead of the Fed or the ECB. So if you look at Latin America, for instance, where they raised interest rates quite considerably very early on, you still have core inflation to be high. I do want to talk a, a little bit about the points that were also raised in terms of what has all of this taught us for the next time we have to battle inflation or if, you know, we have, we have an other problem of inflation being too low. Again, Mohammed's point that what's become clear is that unlike the past where we could take supply as a given, elastic, and, and always reliably there, I don't think we can take that as a case now. Energy markets, for sure, that's no longer the case. So we are in an economy where we're going to be hit more by supply shocks, and therefore monetary policy now faces much more serious trade-offs, unlike the past when it was only about demand management. The second point to make is that I think we have to refine our monetary policy frameworks. So the Fed's monetary policy framework was designed on the assumption, you know, based correctly, given the history of... Uh, uh, where it came from after multiple decades of inflation staying very low and having the so-called flat Phillips curve where you never really have to worry about inflation going uh, too high. The strategy was more about what it would take to make sure that inflation doesn't anchor downwards, de-anchor downwards, so you don't end up in a deflationary situation as opposed to an inflationary situation. I think given what we have seen with the pandemic and the war, is that we need to take into account more the risks of, as, a, as one would say, of running the economy hot, which is of you know, allowing unemployment rates to drift down and not worrying so much about inflation because the trade-offs are quite small. Again, like I said, this is with a huge benefit of hindsight, right? I mean, uh, the framework fitted the environment at that time, but with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I would say, for instance, if you're a country where your unemployment rate is you know, close to a historical average or close to what's normally uh, shows up, and your inflation level is 1.5% as opposed to a target of 2%, 
I think at that time, you, you don't want to necessarily do everything you can to close the gap to 2%. All of the unconventional monetary policy in that space, <coughs> I think, starts becoming riskier, not just for inflation overshooting, but also for financial stability reasons. And secondly, I think we, the strategy of being a little more preemptive with monetary policy, which is that you don't wait to see inflation solidly front and uh, present, uh, but move in advance to prevent that from happening, especially when you're in an environment where labor markets are tight, I think are absolutely critical. And the third point I would make is on how we give forward guidance. Forward guidance has been a powerful tool in the times when we're at the zero lower bound, and we could go back to the zero lower bound, so I think mm -hmm. interest rates could still be very low. So we still have that, uh, that constraint. We could end up there. But I think one of the lessons we've learned is that while forward guidance is great in the sense of providing a lot of commitment and taking out a lot of uncertainty, because it gives you certainty about where monetary policy mm -hmm. is going to go, you do have a trade-off, because sometimes it really ties your hand. And we saw that happen during the pandemic and what followed afterwards, because the strong commitment to when you would raise interest rates or when you would start reducing your balance sheet kind of ended up basically delaying what action was needed. Mm -hmm. And so I think on that front, too, forward guidance is very important, but I think we need escape clauses for when things change. Governor Rio, I want to get to you, but Olivia, you want to make comment here, please? Yeah, it was on the question of design of monetary policy. And I want to go back to the good news which we had in the US, which is that, again, inflation was dominated by price shocks, one after the other. But what was absolutely striking was that these were what we call first round effects. And I was very worried about second round effects, prices, other prices moving, wages moving. There, is, there has been nearly no second round effect in the US. I don't know if it's true elsewhere. But I think that there's a lesson there, which is that there was enough credibility about medium-term inflation that basically people said, OK, it's there, but it will not basically stay. And so I think the conclusion is we're going to have, as, uh, as Gita and others have said, we're going to have other supply shocks. That's very likely. And I think the lesson is, well, let them happen. Let's not try to fight them hard, because if we have invested in credibility, then it's not going to have second round effects. And when the shocks go away, the things will be fine. So I think that lesson is really important. That it may, if you have enough credibility, you don't need to fight the shocks as much as uh, you would otherwise have. Uh, I think, and then two remarks triggered by Gita. Financial stability, I mean, we have a sense that very sharp changes in interest rates are tough for the banking system to react to. I think that's a point that Mohammed made. And so this says try to smooth. And by implication, this means being more preventive than you would otherwise be. Uh, and so I think that's a lesson. And then the third one is fiscal policy, which is we're basically asking the central banks to do all the job. And you know, in the current context, fiscal policy could have helped slow down the US economy. It helped make things better in Europe. It seems to me that, again, we're going to, it goes back to our star very, being very low, little margins for monetary policy in general. We really have to think about the use of fiscal and monetary policy together to react to that type of environment. This has been, I'm going to suggest, more of a Western discussion. Dr. Rhee, with immense respect for the leadership of Korea in moving on inflation with a unique, a singular path that you did. Can you talk about the constraints you have, what I would call the, the lesser degrees of freedom you have, given all that's going on in the world, and then bring it over to Korea, almost looking at a QE, QT path? I explain the path forward you have away from the Western world and what Korea is doing and EM is doing. Okay, uh, I think in terms of uh, our strategy in coping with higher inflation, I think pretty much what we are doing is following the textbook together with the IPF framework. So there's not much controversy. 
But I think uh, what we really do not know at this moment, and we are very curious, is what if we are moving back to the very low inflation period as uh, experienced by the advanced economy, so-called secular stagnation and the uh, zero low bound. Emerging market in Korea hasn't experienced yet. But what happens if in the future, if we have a similar situation, whether QT, QE and other forward guidance can be a tool for us to use it. And it is related with uh, Olivia's suggestion to have a, uh, a little bit higher inflation target as an alternative having a QE. I think that's a very important issue for us because uh, yeah, several uh, EMs use a QE-like uh, you know, instrument during the pandemic. And the several studies show that the effect of their policy has been as effective as some QE policy in advanced economies. But I think that success was attributed to unique uh, feature that during the pandemic there are abundant global supply. And the, the fact that the advanced economies are actually uh, uh, you know, the dumping of the taboo and on a much larger scale unconventional policy and that actually allowed the uh, uh, emerging market to avoid being penalized by the international market for their loose and uh, you know, fiscal and monetary policy. But the real question is that in the future, if emerging market alone face this secular stagnation and low inflation uh, period, uh, and actually the chance is not small because, you know, for at least for the, some Asian e economies like Korea and Asian economies who has a uh, rapid aging problems, then what, what will be their choice? I believe that if you use the QE and the massive expansion of monetary and fiscal policy, exchange rate will skyrocket and there will be a speculative attack. So that doesn't seem to be a good strategy. And also fiscal dominance is a concern. Uh, it will be very hard for us to commit to a strategy that uh, requires large stimulus in the short term while promising the fiscal uh, sustainability in the longer term. So in that case, I think uh, if that happens, in my humble opinion, we have to focus more on structural reform to address the route for the uh, you know, low growth rather than expansion in fiscal policy. But still, fiscal policy has room to target some specific sector and having a growth. The real question is what will be the monetary policy should look like. In my opinion, instead of using the relying on the interest rate instrument, I think uh, monetary policy can use the credit allocation to specific sectors to support uh, you know, uh, you know, the strategic, uh, structural reform. But that definitely there will be some people who criticize that that compromise central bank independence and you are actually helping the fiscal authority, that kind of issues. So I think what Olivia suggests, I think definitely is not a time to having a change in our inflation target. But if you are really worried about it, whether they're having a slightly higher inflation target can be a good alternative to Q, QE, which we cannot use it. Uh, that will be a very serious condition. So at this moment, we are thinking about whether we have to rely on more targeted, non-neutral monetary policy to address the issue versus having a somewhat little bit more higher inflation target that need to be studied further. On inflation policy forward, and I, I want to go to you, uh, Dr. Tenreo, here, and, and I guess it has to do with your London School of Economics, where not that there's a worship, but there's a memory of Phillips curve dynamics. And everybody in this room, everybody on this panel has been shocked at a unique Phillips curve dynamics that we've seen in the pandemic, out of the pandemic, and maybe on to Marrakesh and on to 2024. Discuss the theoretical architecture forward for inflation. Is the Phillips curve dead? No, but let me, let me do two, two remarks before I go to the Philips. Please, curve. make three. So the one is that the, the big fundamental factors that uh, took us to low interest rates will be there when this is over. I mean, demographics, low productivity growth, inequality, uncertainty, they haven't gone away. Uh, so we might uh, f uh, find ourselves in, the, in, in a similar setting. Um, I agree with Gita Mohamed that um, it's, it's possible, and that's, that's a key question, that uh, we are faced with more frequent, uh, more frequent uh, supply side shocks or cost push shocks, uh, particularly related to weather uh, or climate change challenges. So that's a possibility. I'm not sure we, we need a different framework to respond to those shocks. 
Um, I think what we need to remind ourselves is the analytical underpinnings of flexible inflation targeting, which is embedded in most of the remits of central banks today. In the case of the Bank of England, the remit is very clear that in occasions um, the, the inflation rate will um, deviate from target, uh, especially when facing uh, trade-off inducing shocks that are large or persistent or both. And in these situations, the Monetary Policy Committee needs to balance the speed with which it returns inflation to target against output stability and other considerations. But uh, I think it, it's very important that we retain that flexibility and explain it well. It's about returning inflation to target when once we're hit by, by a shock. Um, uh, and that's the role of monetary policy, always returning to the 2% target uh, or whatever the target is that is decided um, uh, or is given to central banks. On the Phillips curve, um, I worked on it um, before the pandemic, 2019, and the main message of our work with Michael McLee was that um, stories about the disappearance of the Phillips Phillips curve or, or the flattening of the Phillips curve were uh, coming from poor identification strategies. Um, and we show evidence that when we well identify, we, we could um, uh, identify a very strong slope of the Phillips curve, so the structure of Phillips curve or aggregate relationship in the economy. That never went away. It's just that we couldn't identify it by simply regressing uh, inflation on, on slack, particularly in a period that there were no, that monetary policy was upsetting those demand shocks. So it was a problem of identification. It never went away and we saw it during the pandemic. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Larian, you and I remember the day Senator Graham of Texas asked a rude question to Alan Greenspan and Greenspan went outside of his lane, over the guardrail, off the cliff, and said something, I can't recall what it was, that today would just be noise. It would just be part of the debate. The, pol the political overlay of everything we're talking about has radically changed in 20 years. If we're gonna have a policy prescription for new inflation coming up, I mean, I, I, if, I've, if I look at the idea of lessons for future policy strategy, I would rephrase it as lessons for future political central bank policy strategy. What does the politics of central bank look like when we extract ourselves from this high inflation? So Tom, the thing that keeps me up at night and the reason why I have been so publicly critical of the Fed um, is that if we're not careful, this episode of inflation and the way inflation is hitting particular segments of the populations hard is going to end up putting in place something that none of us want to put in play, and this organization knows better than anywhere else, which is the importance of the political autonomy of central banks. I am terrified that if central banks don't own their mistakes, if central banks don't learn from their mistakes and are public about this process, people are going to say, you're not accountable enough, and I'm not sure you should have the amount of political autonomy that you do. And operational autonomy is absolutely central, is absolutely critical to a central bank. Already, I mean, we talk a lot about, about credibility and forward guidance. What is the marketplace telling us today? The marketplace itself is doubting the Fed. So the Fed has been very consistent over the last few months that it will keep rates high for all of this year. An absolutely consistent picture. The market says, no, you're not. You're going to start cutting in the second half, and by the end of the year, interest rates will be a full percentage points below what you tell us they're going to be. I've never seen that divergence between forward guidance and what the market is pricing. And I worry that this inability to be held accountable is going to lead first to markets starting to go on their own way, and then of course, at the end of the day, the Fed can force an adjustment, but it becomes more costly if the market hasn't done some of the heavy lifting. And secondly, it will put the political autonomy of central banks in play, which is something that would be very harmful for economic well-being. Olivier, is it too hard now to do monetary policy to have an inflation strategy forward? 
because we're over communicating? Is there too much noise out there now? Would you suggest a lesser communication by central banks? Go back to something you and I remember or is a genie out of the bottle? I surely don't want to go back to the day of, green, of Greenspan. I think that transparency is, is essential and on that, totally desirable. Uh, now, there is always the issue of how the central bank communicates to markets <coughs> and how it takes into account markets, but I, the more transparent that uh, interaction is, I think, the better. There is really no reason not right. to be explicit about what you believe the degree to which you believe it and explaining what you're doing, which I think is more or less what the Fed at this stage is doing. Countdown clock, I got eight minutes left. Olivia, I'm gonna to go to you for one more thought. And then uh, Dr. Gop Gopinath, I wanna to go to you. In your wonderful monograph, quietly permeating through it all on monetary and fiscal policy, on this conundrum of the pandemic, the Biden stimulus, as you coin it, and inflation, is your phrase, the underlying factors of this economy, the overlay of things that almost we don't see out there, underlying factors in all of this economic dialogue. How do those underlying factors, I, let me rephrase this, how should we be aware of those underlying factors to come up with a more optimal inflation strategy? Yeah, I mean, the the inflation story is very much a high-frequency story. It's a few years. I think it will be over within a year. We have these much lower frequency, less visible factors which shape the economy and are extremely important. In, in that context, referring to my book, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, our star clearly has decreased for you know, close to 40 years. Uh, and then the question is, once the inflation episode is gone, how do we go back to where we were? What were the factors behind it? And are these factors going to still be relevant in the future? So as, as you probably know, I had a discussion uh, with Larry Summers about the various factors which were at play. I think it's safe to say that we, don't, we haven't identified a culprit. We have identified a number of suspects on the saving side, the investment side, the demand for safe asset sides. And it seems coherent, but exactly which one matters, how much, mm -hmm. we don't know. So looking forward, the bottom line, given the, the time, is I think the place where uh, we might expect slightly higher R stars uh, is uh, because of investment and debt and public debt. One thing that I see happening is on the green investment. It is clear that we need to do a lot about global warming, and it's clear that there is not much enthusiasm for paying for it. So what economists like, which is carbon taxes, is not happening in the US. It's happening to some extent. And what's happening in the US is subsidies, because subsidies feel much less painful than taxes. Somebody has to pay eventually, but that's ignored. So I, I'm afraid that we might see the right amount of fight against global warming, which is great, which more, means more investment, which would increase our star, right. together with most of the financing by debt, which would also increase our star. So I think there's a scenario where our star is actually higher than it was in the past, but my best guess, it will remain fairly low, and that has implications for everything we've discussed. It is a final comment, and, and Gita, I'm, I'm gonna phrase this gently so you'll invite me back, and I think you know, this will be wonderful onto your meetings in October. The tensions right now of this is endocurrent for Bloomberg wrote today, the resilience has moved on to this debate of fragmentation. The geopolitical overlay we have on our economics now of, of Washington, Beijing, the challenges, immense challenges of the emerging market reacting to larger dominant economies. Could you summarize for this how you would rewrite your World Economic Forum off of what you listened to in the last couple days in bilaterals, in meetings. How would your inflation outlook change over what you've learned the last few days? I assume that's a question for Gita. Right? It's for Gita, that's not for you, be <laughs> quiet. Gita, go for it. <laughs> no, thank you. So this is what, as you can imagine, and correctly guessed, this is a major topic of discussion 
at the meetings bilaterally, but also in our larger meetings. I think everybody agrees that going down the slippery slope of fragmentation is going to clearly reduce efficiency, which is going to put pressure on inflation uh, and reduce potential growth for many countries in the world. Of course, everybody wants to ma match that with the fact that we've had the pandemic and the war, and we need to build, countries need to build resilience uh, to these kinds of shocks and to ensure that they have more secure supply chains and they have economic security and national security. Now, in terms of economic security, it's clear that what countries need to do is to diversify. So yes, maybe we don't have the hyper-efficient sourcing that we used to have before, but I think clearly we need diversification just so that we don't end up with the, kind, the kinds of situations we have in the past. The question though is like, how do you ring fence all of this and not end up with going from, I want resilience to ending up in a protectionist environment. And a big part of these meetings is exactly to prevent something like that from happening. We have analytical work that shows that it can be hugely damaging for the global economy. If you have runaway fragmentation, you, know, you shrink global output by 7% on a permanent basis, which is basically losing Japan and Germany. It's, it is costly, but I think we're still in the process of trying to figure out how to make this work. This has been a wonderful panel to all of you. Thank you so much. We've got a little bit of time up, but I think we'll leave it there. Thank you to all of you here at the International Monetary Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.